And Lord, also that you are pleased and glorified by what's happened here today. Father, we love you so much. And I thank you for, Lord, loving us. And please use me as your servant to preach your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> there's a few scriptures here. And uh, as you can see inside these scriptures, there's kind of a, a separation between the wicked and the righteous. The wicked and the righteous. And this is talking in these scriptures, you know, in verse 7. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish. So what he expects out of life dies with him. You know, and when somebody is lost, they don't know the Lord as their personal Savior. All they have in this life is this life. You know, and there's not much that they have looked forward to afterwards. You know, there are people that hope for that. Um, but the idea is... What we have going on down here has a lot to do with what's going to happen afterwards. That's just the way God had it, and it's very simple and very common sense if you really think about it, because the decisions we make here are going to affect our eternity in many different ways. The decision you make down here about who your Savior is, is Jesus Christ your Savior, do you accept him or not, is going to determine where your location of where you spend eternity. Um, there's either heaven or there's hell. That's just two choices. And it's all left up to you. God has already made everything possible for everybody in this world to make that choice, and it's free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to be good enough for it. You don't have to have certain talents and stuff. You don't have to go to a certain religion for it. It's all free, very simple. If you believe on Christ, you accept him as your savior, you know you're a sinner, you just got to receive Christ. <clears throat> Salvation is eternity in heaven. You don't do that, very simply, you spend eternity in hell. Simple choice, everybody can make it. Everybody has that opportunity to make it before they leave this earth. Now, after that, the decisions we make every day affect our eternity. Now, whether I'm you're heading into hell, it's the decisions you make here, <clears throat> it's going to be rough, no matter how you look at it. But as God's children, if you're saved, the decisions you make every day are going to affect our eternity as well. Um, the Bible talks different, gives us certain things in Scripture, talk about our judgment. Um, you're going to receive rewards or you're going to suffer loss um, at the day of judgment. So those rewards, you know, we're not, you know, it gives us some examples of some of those rewards, but they're really tangible. It's not a big deal. But the Bible also says in heaven that some will, will um, shine brighter like the stars in the, in the sky. Some are brighter and some are not as bright. So there will be a recognition of how you lived your life on this earth for eternity. You know? And so others up there will know, wow, that person, he must have done a lot for the Lord. I don't know all the details in it. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about it. But there is something there. Um, but I want you to understand, getting into heaven... First thing, that's great, right? But there's far more to heaven. Last week I talked a lot about there's far more to earth than just getting saved. There's far more to heaven than just getting in there. Amen? Um, and I want you to think a little bit here this week about the life that you live today and the decisions that you make on a daily basis and what they do for you. And really, what are they going to do for our eternity? The Bible talks about laying up in store ahead of us. Laying up things in store for heaven, not on things of this earth. So there are things that God expects us to, to lay up that's eternal, that's not just temporary, that's just going to be burnt up someday. Now we all live on this earth, so we all have to, um, we got to have things. You know, to get here today, you had to have clothes. You probably ate some food to get here today. You know, to getting up, get ready, get some nourishment. Um, probably many of you came by, by a vehicle, you know. So you have those vehicles and you have those payments and you have the responsibilities. You have a job. You know, there's also more than just work. You also have some relaxation. You have joys that God has get, allowed us to have here on this earth, whether it's hobbies or sports or whatever. So there are things in this life that we have that are really for this life, you know, that have a lot to do with how we're living our life down here. But there are also a lot of things that we do down here that affect our eternity. 
And that's what I want to take a couple minutes here today and talk about. And um, I want to think there was um, a, a lady that just passed away. Many of you know her. She was a senator, Diane Feinstein. Feinstein. How many people know of her or have heard her? Right? That's a lot of you. Now, if you didn't, you know, you don't, you know, must not listen too much to a whole lot of politics, but she's the longest living senator, a woman senator in, in U.S. history, I guess, um, as far as serving senator. She served all the way up until the day she passed a few days ago, and so she's been in the Senate for a long time. It's kind of an odd thing that she voted the day of or right before the day of she, she passed. Tells you a lot about our what's going on in our politics, but <laughs> that's another thing. And you know, and of course, when somebody passes, you start hearing all the good things about them and all that people praise them about and everything. And I'm not getting into politics itself today, but you got to look at. I've been a pastor now for a good number of years, and I've done a lot of funerals. And normally, at a funeral, you talk about that person in a positive sense. And it's, that's that time that, you know, you sit down, everybody has problems, everybody has issues, every, everybody's done things that you regret, and on that day of that funeral, you kind of put those things aside, and you look at the person, especially the people that cared about them, loved them, family members and stuff, people grew up with them, and you want to remember the good things about the person. I'd hate to be remembered at my funeral for all the bad things I've done, right? None of us would want that. But... We also, when you're in a public figure, or you're in the public limelight, you're a servant of the people, you look a lot at who was this person? What did they do for the people, for the society? And then you'll hear people that really like that person and they'll give a lot of these positive aspects, which we're seeing if you watch anything on TV and news and politics, you'll see a lot about that. But then you have to look at it, what if you don't agree with that person? What if you don't agree with the things that they did for the people and for what they stood for? That may not be as positive as what some people may think are positive and other people may not. Now, I look at Senator Dianne Feinstein and I think not good. And a lot of the politics and the policies that she held, um, she was very strong with abortion and stuff and, and keeping that legal and, and backing behind plan, Planned Parenthood and stuff. And very, very big on that. So I'm not for that at all and I think it's wrong. So I'm not going to be positive towards her on that, towards the LGBTQ plus and all that stuff. Community, very big on. Um, there's a lot of policies she did that I look at and I was in California for years. So I mean, I see a lot of the things things that she did. And so as a person, as a Christian, I look at that and say, no, I don't want that. I think those were negative things and bad things. But then there's others that believe in those things that say, oh, that is great. That is great of what she did. I'm glad she's, she was my representative and everything. You see how you have both sides, right? And what you got to do is, no matter whether you're Diane Feinstein or whether you're yourself or somebody else you know, you got to look at everything and say, okay, when we compare them to what God says, that's the side we need to be standing on, right? Even if you're related. I have family members that have done things that I'm like, no, that is wrong, terrible, shouldn't do that, totally. And I will stand in defense of the truth, even though they're family, right? We all under, I, mean, I think that's common sense, correct? Amen. So I want to go through and look at a few things here this, this morning. It says in verse number 10, when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. So it gives us um, um, information here talking about the righteous. So a good person, it helps a large group, a city. So when the righteous are doing good, a city will rejoice. Verse 21. It says, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. So no matter if people get together, if the wicked are together and they join hands and they're supporting and they're strong in that aspect, the Bible says the wicked shall not be go unpunished. It's, it doesn't matter how many there are that are wicked or how, how few they are, they're all going to get punished someday. But the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Now look over at Matthew 11 and... I want to be a help today when we look at our lives and how we live our life today. 
how that affects not only us and those that are immediately around us, but also how it affects our society or the world in general. We are not an island to ourselves. How many people have heard that statement before, right? We're not an island to ourselves. I mean, we are connected to everybody in many different ways. Um, if something happens to you, it's going to affect other people. Now, how much? That kind of all depends on your influence or your area that you're living in. But it, it's going to affect others. And the same thing goes with us as Christians. What we do in our life affects other people. The things I do today, or the things I do generally in my life, don't just affect me, in my family, or this church, or even the community that our church is in. I can have an influence, literally, on our entire nation. And in many aspects, I could have an influence on the world. Because think about this. I go into a voting booth, and I vote in a national election. I'm influencing the nation. I sit here in my pew and I give some money into the plate. I'm influencing the world because our church supports missions. So what I do just in my day, just today when I give, there's people around the world that are getting saved or getting taught about the Lord or guided in some truth because of what I've done here today. Do you guys understand that? So it's not just local, it could literally be world, national and world, that we affect. Look at verse number 28 with me of Matthew 11. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, uh, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I love this, these scriptures here, and I'm sure most Christians that have been in church for a while have heard these scriptures, but the Bible talks about people that are kind of worn down, that are just tired. He says, I will give you rest. Rest is what you want. I remember when we got done with the roof yesterday, we all kind of hung out. Brother Denny brought in some pizza, and we started eating some pizza. We're all done. We're hanging out over in the parking lot for a little bit. And Dennis... He was worn out. I mean, he was tired. He was up there on that roof working hard. He came down. And I just seen him sitting over to the side, and he was just sitting there eating a pizza, you know. And, and I said something. To, oh, I asked him for something that he had to get out of his truck. And he goes, you're going to ask me? i got to get up to get this out of my truck. <laughs> he was just worn. He just wanted to sit and rest for a minute. And that's understandable, amen, because it was tired. I was tired. And after he got that, he sat down. I sat down over near him, amen, <laughs> just to relax. And you want rest. When you're tired, when you've been working hard, it's, that rest means a lot to a person, right? We all know that. We've all been there. And the Bible says that God will give us rest, but he says something in verse 29 we need to take to heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. See, a yoke is a tool for work, but it's a tool that keeps, takes, two, takes two individuals and brings them together to make work easier. That's what a yoke is. And God says, listen, I want you to take my yoke and then learn of me. So he says, join with me and let me help you. Let me show you what this is all about. If there's... One thing I've learned a lot in this life that honestly I don't know how much when I actually learned this point but it wasn't until years after serving the Lord was now that I'm serving with God it sure makes life easier. Now I think it takes experience to learn that. I don't think you learn that overnight or after you've just been serving the Lord for a year or two or so. I think it takes a little long where you can look back and you can see what happened was before Christ. And when you really started serving with God, which we're going to look at in a moment, I'm able to look back and say, boy, my life so much easier since I've had the Lord with me. Everything I do in this life seems so much easier compared to what it was like when I wasn't serving with God. God's saying, I want you to take my yoke on you, and I want you to learn of me. And then he says in that same scripture, 
He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So he's not a taskmaster. He's not there forcing you to be there and to do what you're supposed to do. And that's opposed to how I've done some teaching in my life. I'm one of those people that it's like, it's, when I was younger especially, I'd be like, man, what are you doing? Come on, hurry up, stay up with me. Come on, pick that up, do this. I was a, really hard at just forcing people to work when I was working and doing the way they're supposed to do at my speed. But I've learned over the years, it doesn't always work best like that. Actually, most of the time it really doesn't. Sometimes you need that. We all need that at times. But I've learned letting them see you, knowing that you're there together, you're working together, you let things go. Actually, there was um, um, Brother Daniel said something to me the other day, and we were talking, and he goes, he basically said something about work and how some people aren't working as much as others at times. And, and I was like, yeah, I said, one thing about the ministry I had to learn early on is that we're all volunteers. I can't force people to work harder or do things. It's on their own choice. You just try and motivate them the way they go. You know, and, and it's, it's hard sometimes when you're the worker and you're out there and you're doing the effort and you're putting in it and others aren't maybe pulling their own weight it kind of messes with you a little bit, right? We all know that. And you're like, oh, come on, really? Just let's go. You know, and, and one of the things he said, can I just fire them? I was like, you can't fire a volunteer. <laughs> volunteers are volunteers. You know, they're there for a purpose and it's on their own free will. And I want you to think about your life today and what he's talking about here. He says, I'm meek, I'm lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest to your souls. We need rest. I need rest. All of us in here need rest in our life. Now, what do you need rest from? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Why, what am I needing rest from? Some people, it seems like they need rest from rest. You know, that's all they do is rest, right? Anybody know somebody like that? <laughs> we all know somebody like that. But for the most part, we need rest from what is giving us work, or stress, or just where, where we're ex expending all that energy from. So we need rest, whether it's physical, sometimes you just need that mental rest. You know, this summer has been crazy busy for me, and I, you know, keep, every time I keep thinking, oh, I got a couple days here, I'm going to be able to relax a little bit, that completely changes. And it's like, sometimes I just need to just, I just want nothing to do, no responsibility, I think I'm past those days. I don't think that's a possibility. But the idea is just you want the time to just kind of not be turned on every second. Right? You guys know what I'm saying? Whether it's relationship, whether it's work, whether it's with your own issues that you're dealing with in life, you need some time where you need to rest. Well, God says here in the scriptures, ye shall find rest to your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me state this, and I've said this before, but if... This life for you is hard. You're doing something wrong. I want you to think about that. Pausing for effect. If you feel like you're really hard where it's very stressful for your life, you're doing something wrong. And usually that wrong is you're not working with God. You're either working against him or not with him at all. You're not yoked up. Because I found when I'm working with God, when I have the yoke of God on me, it makes this life so much simpler and easier. I'm not saying you don't work. I'm saying you work. But it just makes it lighter, easier. His burden is light. You shouldn't be worn down. Think about that for a moment as we jump into a couple things. Look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 in your Bibles. And we see the prophet Jeremiah, and he's talking about some things um, to Israel and specifically to a couple of the tribes and Ephraim. But he says in verse number 18 of Jeremiah 31, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. As a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. So he says, I've heard Ephraim, that's the tribe of Ephraim, he's saying, bemoaning himself, kind of complaining to himself, murmuring to himself, and he says, you've chastised me and I've been chastened. So he's been 
getting beaten up a little bit, getting spanked a little bit in some areas. He says, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. See, when you put a yoke on a fresh bullock or, or an ox and, and you want them to join with somebody else, they're not accustomed to it. They're not used to it. And so they buck against it. They pull against it. They pull instead of drive. And it's, you got to get them trained. So you always take um, um, a bullock or, a, or an ox that is with a mature, experienced one. And you put them together so the mature, experienced one will teach that one how to pull. Not do it all themselves, but to share that load. And by doing that, it helps that young one get into a routine and know how to work alongside somebody else. Part of life, I don't care who you are, you got to learn how to work around people and work with other people. Everybody's different. And sometimes you get working with somebody that you don't necessarily get along well with. Anybody ever done that? We all have, right, probably? You always work with somebody that's just frustrating, maybe. As a person, maybe you don't click with them in their personalities. Maybe they do things that irritate you. And so when you have to work together, it can become troublesome. Until you find how to work with them to make it easy. A lot of times, Christians do the same thing with God. Especially young Christians, you know, when they first jump in, they get excited, they like the change in things, they, they realize there's a difference in their heart and in their life, but then they start living their life, and if you don't get properly trained, they don't know how to share that yoke. And when that yoke gets on them with the Lord, they yoke up with God, and they start doing what God wants them to do, and God's trying to change them, they're not accustomed to it, so they start button again oh hey let's go I need to I need to do this you know when I was a young preacher I'd have people get saved or something and they'd come in like preacher I want to do something for God what can I do I want to join this I want to join I want to start this I want to start that and I used to be yeah go for it here's something to do here's something to do join up with this come with this man I would send them going but I found most of the time not all the time sometimes there's the exception but most of the time that person would be burnt out or quit within a short amount of time because they just, they were just trying to pull it all themselves and they didn't know how to be balanced enough in their life and they needed somebody to show them how to be balanced. So I, as I've matured as a pastor, I've learned, hey, if you're a young Christian, young at heart, I want to keep your zeal going, but I also, let's put some balance to this. Let's get some training underneath, know how to work with somebody or with God and so you're not, so you get accustomed to the yoke, you get used to it. You guys understand that point for a moment? Look at a couple things in Scripture. Look over at Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Now listen to this, and I want you to do this for a moment. Think about the state of our country right now. Whatever you have a thought about our country in general, let's think about these Scriptures for a moment. Verse number 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem, now this is God's children, Jerusalem is the head, and from Judah, the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Now, in this scripture, the Bible is saying God is going to take away from Jerusalem and Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread, the whole stay of water. Now, just a quick thing, the stay is... Basically, your support, your sustenance. That's what you got to live. Bread and water are the core of how we live, our sustenance. The staff is the support. It's the power. It's the strength. Okay? And then he goes down to say in verse 2, The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, the prudent and the ancient. So he's going to take away these things as well. Kind of sounds like where we're at today in our country. He's taken away a lot of the things that are necessary for a good country. The leaders in this, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient. Boy, we're seeing a lot of loss in these areas. And it says in verse 3, the captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. Well, these are like the cream of the crop. It's the professionals. It's the ones that kind of help and not hurt. They're the ones that kind of organize things in a country. I mean, I don't care what side of the party you're on right now in any ways, because both sides are a mess right now. I mean, we have a 
president that's embarrassment right now, just he's that. I don't want to get into a personal thing. We had a previous president that has a lot of issues and stuff too, you know, that does acts like a child sometimes and how he speaks to people and calls them names. But I mean, you look at everything and you look at the people that are in charge right now and you're like, wow. It's just, where are we at? How did we get here? And you say, well, where's the answer at? Right now we're heading into elections. We're starting to see all the different people coming out and saying, I want to do this. Whether it's local, whether it's legislator, senator, president. We're seeing a lot of people stepping up and saying, hey, I got these ideas. This is what I want to do. And so we as a people, we judge these things. And you make judgment calls on, okay, I want this person, I want that, but I don't like this about that person, but I have to vote on this one, or I should vote on this, but I don't like that. And so you go through all these things, and I'm using national because I think it's clear, everybody understands this. And so you look at the individual, and you base that individual on, how is this for our country? How is this for me? How is this for my children and my grandchildren? How is this person going to affect us as a whole of who we represent as a nation, right? That's what we do. As Christians, we should know right from wrong. We're expected to know right from wrong. We have an instruction booklet. So we go to the booklet and we say, okay, this is right, this is wrong, this is wrong, that's right, this is right, this is what I'm looking for, this is what I'm not. And you're doing all of that, and you're looking at that to a person. You're applying it to a person that now is going to represent you and I. Right? Isn't that what you basically do in politics? I want you to think about that. Do you do the same thing for yourself? I said earlier that we're not an island to ourselves. A lot of people really put a lot of, well, I don't want to say that. We should put a lot of thought and intelligence into knowing who we're voting for and why they stand for what they say. Are they living what they say, not just saying it? We should do the same thing for ourselves. We should look at ourselves and say, am I representing right? Am I representing my family, my church, my God the right way, properly? Am I doing that right? What do I stand for? Why do I believe what I believe? Am I living the way I'm saying people ought to live? Shouldn't we all be doing that for ourselves? That's usually kind of what you do when you come to church, or you should. You're kind of looking at improving yourself when you come in the doors. And, all right, what's God going to challenge me with today? How can I leave these doors different, changed? We see something here where God says, listen... I'm going to take away some things. Usually you take some things away out of punishment. I'm a parent. There's things I take away from my kids as a punishment. Something that they like, something that may be even good. I say, no, you're not going to have that for a little while. It's a punishment. Because you want them to think, I don't want to lose that. That's important to me. Let's go a little bit further. And he says in verse 4, I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. So now he's saying, listen, I'm going to give people that really shouldn't be in that position, that position. I'm going to give young babes to rule over them. He says in verse 5, and the people shall be what? Oppressed. Well, I tell you what, we're being oppressed right now. I don't, 100%. Every one by another and every one by his neighbor and the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. So those that are, should be respected and honored are not being respected and honored. The base against the honorable, the person that, that, that is messing up in every area are against now the honorable, the people that are doing it right. Verse 6, and when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father saying, thou hast clothing be thou our ruler and let this ruin be under thy hand. So they're picking other people and saying, hey, you got this. You should be a ruler. You got the clothing. You, you, you look good. And that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer. For in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. 
So there's coming a time where he says, I'm not going to deal with this. Man, I, I can't. I'm not going to take this responsibility on myself. I've got to take care of my own home. I don't have the things that I need right now. I'm not going to try and take on the responsibility of everybody else. I'll tell you what, we're getting closer and closer to that time in our country where people don't want to take the responsibility anymore. There are police officers quitting by the dozen, by the millions or thousands around this country because they don't want that responsibility. No, I'm not going to do that. People, good people that would be good in good positions, good legislators and senators saying, I'm, I'm not going there. I can't deal. I'm dealing with my own stuff. There are good people that are saying, don't pick me as a ruler. I'll tell you what, I've thought about that. I was like, man, if I, everybody wanted me to do anything, I'd be like, nah, <laughs> no thank you. But that's the times that we're getting to that, that happened to Jerusalem. It says in verse, verse number 8, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. He says, the reason people just aren't doing anything for God anymore. They're against him. Hey Christian, we should pay attention to what's happening here. The reason Judah and, Jer and Jerusalem are fallen because everything they do is against God anymore. And we are getting far away from being a Christian nation. And I'm using a lot of generalities as a nation for a minute, but it's time for those that know better to do better. Amen? And that's God's children. Because there'll be, com they'll be coming a time when even those that know better are going to say, I'm not going to do better for you. I'm going to be doing better for me and mine. That's not a good place to be in because no one's an island to themselves. We need each other. We need each other because two are better than one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You need people. God put people together in families. God started the church for a reason because you can do more with just one person. You can do more with a lot more people. We can be more effective when more people get together and do something together. Just like when we were doing the roof yesterday, we could have been done quicker if we had more people, but thank God we had a good amount of people so we were able to get done quick. You see what I'm saying? But if it was only me up there or only me and Dennis or something up there, we wouldn't have got the job done. Well, maybe we would have. We too could have probably done it. But it would have been a lot harder. I want you to think about yourself now. This is where we're going to turn in, in, inwards just for the last few minutes. It says in verse number 9, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. Listen to this next point. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. That's woe. That's an exclamation point. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. You know what's happening? What happened to Jerusalem and Judah? They didn't care about hiding their sin anymore. Open. This is who I am, like it or not. And even to this point where we're dealing in our society with, you better like it or I'm coming after you. That's where we're at right now. Same thing that happened to Judah and Jerusalem that destroyed them. The same thing that's happening to us as a people. But it all started with the individual. That's what I always go back to. It all starts with you and I. You can't blame something on a whole because the whole's made on the individuals. It's you and I. You know, we look at these scriptures and we can look at so much and we say, they hide it not. You know what? Shame on us if we're not ashamed of our sin anymore. Shame on you if you're not ashamed of your sin anymore. You do something wrong, you shouldn't be proud of it. You shouldn't flaunt it. It should humble you. You should say, man, I messed up. I'm sorry. See, Satan's trying to flip the script on that. He's been doing that for years, but he wants everybody to think, oh, nobody's perfect. That's fine. Be who you want to be. Act the way you want. Don't be ashamed of yourself. Be proud of yourself. There are many things in my life I'm not proud of that I committed or I did. I'm ashamed of. 
and rightfully so. If I do something wrong today, I should be ashamed of that, right? Used to be common when I was a kid, at least the parents were saying, shame on you. Now we're not seeing that anymore. People are in acceptance stages now. Just accept them for whoever they are and what they do. There's a big difference on that definition of acceptance today. I accept my kids as being my kids and I love them to death, but if they do something wrong, shame on them. Amen? I still accept them as my child, but I don't accept that behavior. Amen? There needs to be a difference. But we're living in a society that's not like that anymore. But we're going to a place that is not good for any of us. Look at what it says real quick, Matthew 24, verse 37. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, under the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. People just going about living their life and didn't have a clue. I'll tell you what, if you don't have a clue that we're living in the last days, wow. It's not time to live our life as normal anymore. We need to live our life with some urgency. We need to start behaving the way we're supposed to, knowing that it's going to make a difference. And that it's affecting not just me, but everybody around me. I tell you, I believe it's so important, since I'm talking nationally, it's so important for each person to look at everybody that you have to vote for and say, how do they line up with the word of God? If people would just get back to just looking at whoever we're putting in charge of us by what the Bible says instead of what it benefits us, there'd be a difference in our country. Now, for the last couple minutes, real quick, we are the representative ourselves. Let's forget all about our nation for a minute. And let's think about our families. What do you want for your family? What do you want for those that you love and care about the deepest? Are you that example? If you had to be voted into your family, how would that go? Would you get voted in? We all leave here today making choices, making decisions. We're on one of the two sides, the wicked or the righteous. If you're on the righteous side, there's a lot that determines what we do here today on our eternity. So how I'm living my life, the decisions that I'm making, what's best not just for me but for the whole has a lot to do with what I do today and the decisions I make. I want my eternity to be the best I possibly can make it. Not really for me for selfish gain, but to know, hey, I, I've done it right. I did this for the Lord. I want him to be pleased by what I did. I've learned kind of what that's like being a parent because I want my kids to be proud of me. I want my kids, when they get to that age where they've reasoned and they can figure things out, to say, you know what, I had a great dad. He loved me, he sacrificed for me, he wanted the best for me, even when he punished me. I want them to be able to know the difference between righteous and wicked. I want them to know that I train them properly to see past the hype, to see past the facade that so many people today put on, see past the words and look at the actions. There's a lot of adults today that can't even do that because they're unaccustomed to the yoke. They haven't been that yoke with Christ long enough to get used to it. 
They'll put it on for a little bit and then take it off because they want to do it their way, at their speed. They don't want to listen to the one in charge. They're not custom to the yoke. They just haven't gotten used to serving with God. Hey, Christian, can I say this? Get accustomed to the yoke. Put that yoke on you and serve with the Lord. This life here is service. We are at work. Everybody knows about heaven. Heaven is rest. Amen? We have everything of rest when we get to heaven. There's no more work, the Bible says. We're in rest. This is the job. So do it the easiest way by getting that yoke on you and learn of Christ and do it his way to make it easier. I've worked hard most of my life. I've learned as I've gotten older, there's sometimes there's a hard way to work and an easy way to work. I used to pick up a stack of boards, throw them up on my shoulder and just work and go do it. Now I'm like, where's the forklift? You know, it's just a little bit different. Finish the same thing, but now it's going to be easier. And you know what? I'm not as worn out at the end of the day. I have energy now. See what I'm saying? Hey, Christian, hey, learn to work, but learn to work easier with the Lord. Get accustomed to that yoke because you're the responsibility now. You're the leader. All of us in here can affect not just our families, our church, our community, but also our nation and even this world if you do what God is asking you to do. Amen? I have literally a page and a half notes that I have not even gotten to yet. So come back next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for your word. And I thank you that we can really look at this through your eyes. Lord, what happened to Judah and Jerusalem, where you took away their stay and their staff, their power, Lord, their sustenance. Lord, I pray it doesn't happen to us. But Lord, if it does happen to our country and our world, help it, Lord, not to happen to us individually, Lord, in our realms of, Lord, just the areas that we have influence in, that we can do our best to be the best example of how a child of God is supposed to be. But help us all, Lord, to get accustomed to that yoke. Lord, that we'll just work with you, for you, and learn of you, and let you teach us, Lord, the right, way, right ways of doing things, and Lord, how to do things right and behave right. Lord, I pray that you please help each person in here, Lord, to yoke up with you in their lives and enjoy the life that you have given us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's take a few minutes and let's talk to the Lord. And I think it's very important for all of us to really pay attention to how we're living this life, the decisions that we're making See, there was a time when, in the days of Noah where people didn't see what was happening around them. They weren't yoked up with God. They didn't believe what Noah was preaching. He was right. They were all wrong. But they were just going about their own life. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people today doing the same thing. You know, I talked a little bit about politics here today. And I tell you, our country is a mess. This world is a mess. And there are good people out there. We just got to pray that the good people will step in. And that those that have a lot of the right things will step up and do better. But it starts with us. There's a lot of good homes. There's a lot of good parents. But they're working too hard on their own. And they haven't been working with the Lord. Maybe morals are in the right place, but they're worn out. It feels like it's a struggle every minute. Don't let it be a struggle. Don't let this life that God gave us to enjoy be a struggle, be hard. Learn to do it with God. And that's a whole nother message, talking about how to do that. But it starts with just doing the things that you know better, that you know you should be doing. Hey, being in church today, that's a good start. You know you should be here. Praying, opening up your Bible, learning from it. That's a good start. That's, you know you should be doing that. 
but how you represent yourself out in the community, to your friends, your family, the things you talk about, the things you make important. That all has to do with linking up and yoking up with the Lord. Let's take a few minutes and talk to God. And if you're in here today, I want to give you hope. Jesus loves us so much. There is victory in Jesus. He gave, came to this world for a purpose, and that purpose was for you. You personally, he knows your name. He knows everything about you. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. He knows how many tears that you shed. He knows and loves you more than anybody can ever even possibly understand. And he wants to work with you. If you're a child of God in here today, why don't you choose today to yoke up with God? Don't be unaccustomed to the yoke. You need the training. Get working with God. Let's take a few minutes and talk to the Lord. If you're not saved in here today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know him today personally. All you got to do is call unto him. Admit that you're a sinner, that your sin is what separated you from the Lord. Believe the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you just got to say, Lord, I believe and I'm sorry. Please forgive me and save my soul. The Bible says he promises to give you eternal life. If you're in here today and don't know that for sure, would you slip your hand up? Anybody at all? Preacher, I'm not, saved. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'd like to pray for you. Anybody at all? Preacher, I'm not sure. Would you raise your hand? All right, Christian, let's take some time and talk to the Lord. Let's make a difference in our life and in our world. Wonderful sermon. Thank you for that, Pastor. Just the, the yoke of Christ is with He uh, pulling most of the weight. We can get through life, and, and it was a blessing to me. Thank you for that, Pastor. Just a reminder: those of you who want to uh, interested in the choir, we're going to meet right down here in the front with Brady. So if you're interested in that, right after uh, prayer, uh, come down here, and we'll have a meeting. No evening service. Tonight, there's a wedding here, um, Spanish wedding, so they're going to be taking our service uh, past uh, when we would be uh, having our service. So there's no evening service. So we'll be here Wednesday and as well as next Sunday. So let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for, for your love. Lord, thank you that, that, Lord, life is easy. Sometimes it's difficult, but with you as our leader, with you uh, guiding our, our, our pathway, that, Lord, we, we can uh, enjoy life, Lord, and help us to, to stay faithful, help us to stay busy for you, and, and uh, Lord, there's so much that needs to be done. And, uh, Lord, help us to be faithful in, in all that you've called us to do. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Let's, those in the choir, come on down to the front. <laughs>